Good evening, everyone. Today is June the 13th, Thursday, June the 13th, around 8 o'clock p.m., and you are listening to the Digipire podcast. We now stream every Thursday at 8 p.m. sharp. We no longer stream five days a week. I just it got to be too much work to do a five-day-a-week show. I just did not have the time to allocate to it. So now we are streaming every Thursday at 8 p.m. So be sure to join in at that time on your favorite podcast app or directly at our website, digipire.com slash podcast. Today we are talking about, today we are discussing having a brick and mortar business versus an online line business. I have a lot of experience in both. I had a brick and mortar business for a few years, and I will be discussing that and compare it to its online counterpart. So we will be discussing that today. Please keep in mind you can view an outline of today's podcast of what we are going to discuss at digipire.com slash brick. You can also listen to all of our other podcasts on our website, digipire.com. Before we get started, I'd like to talk a little bit about Squeaker.com. It's the platform that I use to create this podcast. It's a very it's very nice. You can do it from your less desktop computer and you also can do it from your mobile phone as long as you have internet access. It makes it very nice cuz you can do this podcast if you're in the mountains of West Virginia where I'm from or on the beaches in Florida, California, Hawaii or wherever you may be in the world as long as you have an internet connection like I said and a smartphone that can down that you can download the the speaker app with makes it very very nice if you're not interested in creating a podcast speaker.com also has a wealth of podcasts that you may be interested in and mine is on that platform as well of course and you can find it there some of you have found it on google some of you have found it through my website but however you found it Speaker.com is an excellent app to listen to your podcast if that's what you like to do. It's also an excellent app if you are a creator or you want to create a podcast. It's a very easy application to use. The learning curve is very low and all that good stuff. So I'm going to move on. I'm going to talk about all news that is news and e-commerce. And I'm going to do that in just a few short seconds. I'm going to set up here. Set up here. You are listening to the Digipire podcast, episode 10, on June the 13th, 2019. You can view show notes and an outline of what we have discussed or will be discussing at digipire.com slash episode 10. So apparently Grub or apparently Amazon has shut down its restaurant delivery service. I know that they only offered this in a few markets. It wasn't any any of the markets I'd ever been in. It wasn't in Columbus or, or my hometown. But after they have done that, Grubhub shares have jumped. So if you're a user of Grubhub, which Grubhub has expanded into a lot of different areas but they, they're they kind of limited on what they offer, at least in Huntington. In Columbus, they have more, more of an offering. But that's good news for, you know, Amazon tries to get their hands on a little bit of everything. They, they seem to be like the Walmart of e-commerce. I think that they they'd probably, I mean, not that I need to tell them how to run their business or doing a fine job of it, but they need to let some of the little guys make some money and, not, you know, and just move out of the way. I mean, there's no way that you can be 
a master of everything. It's just there's just so much, so much involved. There's a lot of little people in the restaurant delivery service. Grubhub is the major, the major one. I know that they even deliver Taco Bell, uh, Taco Bell, Kentucky Fried Chicken, and where's the other one? I've seen them. I've seen them somewhere else. There's actually a Kentucky Fried Chicken eating inside the other day, and I saw a oh Golden Corral. Golden Corral is a big thing over over here. So they, which I'm not even sure how that works because it's a buffet, so I'm not sure exactly how that works with them. But I knew Grubhub is a, 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 has a pretty big market share. Now they don't deliver groceries or anything like that. There's another, there's another website or app that, that does that, and I can't think of it right offhand, but I've actually used them before, and it's on my phone. I guess I could look at it since I'm podcasting from my mobile, but. I'm not going to do that right now, but yeah, so share, I'm going to read this article. It's from CNBC. I'm just going to do a summary. It's shares of online food delivery services Grubhub and Waiter Holdings jumped Tuesday after Amazon said it was shutting down its four-year-old rival service, which delivered restaurant meals to Prime and members' doorsteps. Let's keep in mind the Amazon, they lose money on Amazon Prime. Grubhub shares, which have a market value of $6.3 billion, gained more than 7% on Tuesday, while shares of smaller rival rival Waiter gained 3%. Waiter has a market cap of $482.7 million. Uber, which operates Uber Eats. Ah, losing my... Damn, hold on. Which operates Uber Eats, saw its stock, which is valued at $71.5 billion, rise less than 1%. I've seen Uber Eats offered at McDonald's and places like Washington, D.C. I haven't anywhere near where I live, but Uber Eats isn't as big of a player as a Grubhub. And again, I think Uber Uber needs to focus on, on driving people around, getting them from point A to point B, and let someone else worry about delivering the food and all that kind of stuff, even though it's a logical segue, I guess, for lack of a better word, a logical step towards growing their business since they basically have the infrastructure. But I think Grubhub, they should leave it to Grubhub and they should, Uber and Amazon should focus on their individual specialties. So yeah, you can find out, you can, you can find a link to that news article at digipire.com slash episode 10 in the show notes. So... So now Poshmark took on secondhand apparel. Now it's getting into home and decor. And again, this is from CNBC, and you can find the link to that article at digipire.com slash episode 10 in the show notes. And this is something that, that, that comes a little bit closer to home because I used to have a thrift store, a thrift shop. And Poshmark is basically an online thrift shop, similar to Mercari. If you haven't heard from heard about Mercari, Mercari and Poshmark are pretty big players in the resale space, and they've really they've really given eBay a run for their money. I know that eBay is worried about these two. If you look up anything related to you know eBay, eBay and Poshmark or eBay and Macari, you can. It's very interesting to see what they think about them, or at least what other people think that they should think about them. But they are taking on. They're getting into home decor, so I'm going to read this briefly to you, and then we'll discuss it just a little bit. Poshmark wants to be more than just an online marketplace for used clothes and purses. The retail resale platform announced Tuesday is getting into home decor, taking on the likes of Wayfair and Rent the Runway, which also recently started renting home goods like throw pillows and blankets. As we launch into home goods, a lot of that is centered around the fact that our community is leading us there. CEO and founder Manish Chandira said, Our vision is to become the social commerce platform of choice. The expansion comes as more and more shoppers are turning to secondhand marketplaces like Poshmark, Rebag, and The Real Real to buy Louis Vuitton handbags or Nike sneakers at lowest at lower prices. 
And I will tell you that the Poshmark and Mercari, I've made money on them. I've sold on them. I still actually, I still actually do sell on those on those platforms. And you can do, you know, very very well with them if you study anyone that sells there, which I highly highly recommend you do. You can tell that they have a, a pretty good turnover. They, you know, there wasn't eBay went without a, without competitors for a long long time, and since the advent of all these Android apps and iPhone apps. They've really had to step up their game. You know, back when I first started, the only competitor was competitors were Amazon auctions and Yahoo auctions, and both of those are now defunct. Of course, Amazon went on to to basically to basically evolve from Amazon auctions into the store. I mean, third-party sellers can sell in there, but they no longer have auctions. I'm not sure exactly when they did away with it, but it was quite some time ago. So you have a lot of options to sell online now, not not just Poshmark or Mercari, but you also have you have Facebook Marketplace, which which is a, a big contender. I mean, that can do an entire series on just marketing and advertising or marketing your e-commerce store on Facebook. There's people, at least from my research research and extrapolating a lot. I can tell that a lot of people seem to to do very well just advertising on Facebook Marketplace. Some really some mom and pop shops, you know, and also there are you know people just everyday people like us, like you and me, that that sell just stuff that they want to get rid of in the house, turn stuff that was they otherwise if they're now into to quick cash on Facebook Marketplace. I've also done that. So yeah, if you want to to read the full article. On CNBC, you can go to my website digipire.com/episode10, and it's on the show notes. So now we're going to move on to to something about the apparel retail earnings. It's all about apparel today, isn't it? So this is also coming from CNBC, and the headline is apparel retail earnings. Haven't been this bad since the Great Recession. Apparel retailers' earnings reports haven't been so disappointing since the Great Recession. That's pretty bad. Companies ranging from Gap Inc. to J. Jill to Canada Goose and Abercrombie and Fitch delivered disappointing earnings reports in recent days, casting blame for the results on issues such as cool and wet weather, weak traffic at malls, the wrong promotions in stores, and overall product missteps. The bad news has sent those stocks and their broader industry tumbling. The S&P 500 retail ETX XRT was down nearly 2% Friday afternoon and has fallen nearly 13% this month, putting it on pace for its worst month, worst month since November 2008 when the XRT lost 20.25%. You know, it might be just what I was talking about just a couple couple minutes ago, the the advent of Poshmark and Mercari and all of and Facebook Marketplace, where people are, are, are buying used goods or recycling goods and that kind of thing. I think it's even more profound than it was when eBay first started. I mean, just because you have so much, so much, so many more people online back, back, so many more people online, more so than back in the 90s and early 2000s when not everyone and their brother had internet access, let alone high speed internet access. And so you have a lot more options to buy used clothes, or used goods, or, or things like that, or or second rate, or second not second rate, but how would you call it? When like places like Target and Marshalls, they have second quality goods a lot of times, and those places, from what I can tell, or from the news that I've heard, seem to to do well and thrive. In this marketplace, where places like you know, and where's the, the Abercrombies and the Gaps and the places who sell new clothing and and high-end clothes aren't doing as well. So, if you have uh, if you're selling on Mercari or or Poshmark or any of those places, you have a chance to do you know do do pretty good. And with Poshmark, there's a lot of options. I'm, I can do a whole like I said a whole a whole podcast or whole conversation or a whole video just on that but I would really look into it if you haven't been selling on them you can use it to, as leverage 
to, you know, to get into other stuff, liquidate everything that you have, buy more products, sell. I mean, there's a lot of room for the small potatoes like you and me. You don't have to be Amazon or Walmart, any of that stuff to, to be able to make money in e-commerce. And, you know, that's what we're going to talk about today, having a brick and mortar shop versus having a, a store online and all the advantages and disadvantages and all that kind of stuff. Then I want to answer some questions that I have had in the past about the two, specifically my brick and mortar shop. So, yeah, I'm going to, to do that and just a few as soon as I get through with the news. So next, we are going to talk about Costco and the $400,000 diamond ring. Okay, so episode 10, brick and mortar. Ver so this is also coming from CNBC, and the headline is apparel retail earnings haven't been this bad since the Great Recession. Apparel retailers' earnings reports haven't been so disappointing since the Great Recession. That's pretty bad. Companies ranging from Gap Inc. to J. Jill to Canada Goose and Abercrombie and & Fitch delivered disappointing earnings reports in recent days, casting blame for the results on issues such as cool and wet weather, weak traffic at malls, the wrong promotions in stores, and overall product missteps. The bad news has sent those stocks and their broader industry tumbling. The S&P 500 retail ETX, XRT, was down nearly 2% Friday afternoon and has fallen nearly 13% this month putting it on pace for its worst month, worst month since November 2008 when the XRT lost 20.25%. You know, and it might be just what I was talking about just a couple couple minutes ago, the, the advent of Poshmark and Mercari and all of and Facebook Marketplace where people are, are, are buying used goods or recycling goods and that kind of thing. I think it's even more profound than it was when eBay first started. I mean, just because you have so much, so much, so many more people online back, back, so many more people online, more so than back in the '90s and early 2000s when not everyone and their brother had internet access, let alone high-speed internet access. And so you have a lot more options to buy used clothes or use goods or, or things like that, or, or second rate, or second, not second rate, but how would you call it? When, like places like Target and Marshalls, they have second quality goods a lot of times. And those places, from what I can tell, or from the news that I've heard, seem to, to do well and thrive in this marketplace where places like, you know, and what is this, the Abercrombies and the Gaps and the places who sell new clothing and, and high-end clothes aren't doing as well. So if you have, uh, if you're selling on Mercari or, or Poshmark or any of those places, you have a chance to do, you know, do, do pretty good. And with Poshmark, there's a lot of options. I'm, I can do a whole, like I said, a whole, a whole, podcast or whole conversation or a whole video just on that but I would really look into it if you haven't been selling on them you can use it to, as leverage to you know to get into other stuff liquidate everything that you have buy more products sell I mean there's a lot of room for the small potatoes like you and me you don't have to be Amazon or Walmart any of that stuff to, to be able to make money in e-commerce and you know that's what we're going to talk about today having a brick and mortar shop versus having a, a store online and all the advantages and disadvantages and all that kind of stuff. Then I want to answer some questions that I have had in the past about the two, specifically my brick and mortar shop. So yeah, I'm going to, to do that and just a few as soon as I get through with the news. So next, we are going to talk about Costco and the $400,000 diamond ring. So once again, this news article is coming from CNBC.com. You can go to their website and search for Costco, or you can go to digipire.com slash episode 10, and it will be in 
a link to this article will be in uh, the show notes. So, apparently Costco, Costco sold someone a $400,000 diamond ring. Did you know you can buy diamond rings at Costco and expensive ones at that? The warehouse retailer said during its latest quarter ended May 12th, it got a, it got a sales boost thanks to a customer purchasing one of its rings for more than $400,000. It didn't say which ring exactly, but a search on Costco's website reveals only one ring priced in the $400,000 range. A round, brilliant, 10.03 carat VS1 Clarity, one color diamond platinum solitaire ring. Costco's website shows 500 different rings for sale, many costing more than $50,000. My my question would be, you know, is this person that bought the four hundred thousand dollar ring going to resell it? Is it planning on making money on it? Are people going to Costco to to, to sell rings? I know that a lot of the, there's two jewelry stores in my hometown that have gone out of business com- completely, and I think that maybe there's only there were like four or five jewelry stores. Now there's one or two left, maybe maybe they're just one, but. Several of them have have gone out of business, and that goes along the whole death of the the brick and mortar. The, I mean, it's been going on for 20 years now, and it's finally starting to catch up with a, a lot of these stores. People are just not just not buying, going in brick and mortar stores and buying. Hell, they're not even eating eating in restaurants anymore. They're coming home and eating all these delivery places. I'm just going to be a ghost town before long. Which can be a good thing if you don't like waiting in line. Maybe you know a lot of people will be eating at home and and you, the lines will be shorter. I don't know. But anyway, that seems to be to to be a trend. I would love to know how if this person is reselling it, like I said, or if people are buying things off Costco to to resell. I don't know. It'd be interesting to find out. I I prefer Sam's Club over Costco for whatever reason. I do I do like the fact that Costco seems to treat their employees better and and that. So, you know, maybe I should give Costco more of a chance. I don't know, but I like Sam's Club food, their samples. I, I just like their, their I just like them better. But as far as their corporate policies and and all that, I think Costco has them beat. So, you know, I don't know. So, I'm going to to move on to the the next the next news flash and again if you want to to read that article in its entirety you can find it on cnbc.com or you can go to digipire.com slash episode 10 and it will be in the show notes so moving on we're going to discuss how a flower delivery company has gone bankrupt So Spreaker is a content creation system, and a you can listen to podcasts on it as well. You can download the Spreaker app on Google on your Android device or on iTunes. And if you are a creator, they have a monetization platform. They have you can record your podcast and stream them live from your mobile phone. So wherever you may be in the world, whether you're in the mountains of West Virginia, Colorado, or Washington State, or if you're on in the on the beach of South Florida, California, or Texas, or wherever you may be in the world, you can as long as you have internet access, you can stream your podcast, listen to podcast from your mobile device or even your your desktop if it's a, a windows a desktop you can do that from that as well as like i said as long as you have internet access so you can find them on spreaker.com next i'm going to talk a little bit about some of the things that i have found on flippa.com and empirebuilders.com some of the the dream acquisitions that i would love to have and I'm going to talk about them in just a few seconds. So just give me a few seconds while I gather my thoughts. Okay, before we get started on the comparing a brick and mortar, owning a brick and mortar shop, whether it be a restaurant, a thrift store like I had, 
or just whatever and comparing it to its online counterpart, I want to talk a little bit about a couple of places that you can buy a, a business that's already built online, like a, an online business that's already been established or, or built and, and already making money. And two of those places, uh, two places that I go to to get information and to, and to find opportunities are Flippa.com and EmpireFlippers.com, and both both have their they're, they're, they're both very different, and but they're both reputable places to buy businesses. But EmpireFlippers.com will bet their will vet the, the, the people selling their businesses a little better than Flippa. Pretty much anyone that's willing to pay the fee can sell their website or their app or whatever on Flippa. And so I'm going to discuss a little bit about them and the advantages of, of buying a, a, a business that's already been established from one of those two places. There's, there's a couple other reputable places, but I'm not going to go into them right now. But yeah, so on Flippa.com and EmpireFlippers.com, you can buy anything from from a network of KDP, KDP, uh, Kindle, Kindle, Kindle publishing books, where people have have written books, eBooks, or paperbacks, to buying apps, to buying software as a service websites, just anything that you can imagine, you can buy on those two websites. So in keeping with the spirit of digipire.com and wanting to keep everything, you know, everything in the cloud, making money in the cloud, buying businesses in the cloud and all of that, I'm going to focus on those things that are digital and that you can that are that are that you don't have to, to, to interact with physically. And what I mean by that is there are some websites on there that they're e-commerce driven and they require that you have product and and that kind of thing, even, you know, that you're going to have to handle product. And the more you have to handle something you're selling, the more it costs to, the more, the more that you have to handle something, the, the more overhead that is involved and the more overhead, the less profit that you make, of course. So I'm going to focus on things that, that don't have to that, that don't require having a physical inventory. You know, e-commerce doesn't necessarily mean that you're that you're that you're buying that you're that you're selling things in the physical realm. You could be selling ebooks, you could be selling data, or just whatever. And the exception to what I'm just talking about is if they're if they're drop shipping. There's some drop shipping sites on there, drop shipping businesses on there that I would pursue because I don't have to physically handle a product. Now, on empireflippers.com, the the websites are a little pricier than Flippa. You can find some good deals on flippa.com if you're if you're if you have a low budget like under $5,000, especially for apps and that kind of thing. But I don't recommend that you buy something like this if you don't know what you're doing or don't have access to someone that you trust who who they know who knows what they're doing. Or I don't I don't recommend it because it's not for the faint of heart. Today I'm going to talk about one that I found on EmpireFlippers.com. It's a hold on, I'm to find it here. It's a an Amazon KDP niche, a, a Amazon KDP network of books and and paperback ebooks and paperback books that this person has created, and it's in the religion and spirituality. Religion and spirituality, I can't even say that word for some reason, spirituality and children's books. And it's KDP, it's a, that means Kindle Direct Publishing. That means they've, they've published this stuff. Oh, computer just died. Ah, that's not good. I don't know why I just did that. Just a second, I'll be with you in just a moment. My computer, did, oh, here it goes. It's a religion and spirituality niche, and I'm going to read the summary here. This listing is for an Amazon KDP business created in September 2017 in multiple niches. So they have several several books that they have written. And 2017, and it's bringing in, it's bringing in 
the, the revenue is 37.12. The monthly profit is 29.06. So that is a pretty substantial. Okay, so the business features 23 paperbacks, 13 ebooks, and 13 audiobooks in the religion and spirituality and children's niches. The business has year one, year on year growth, and thanks to a team of writers, requires minimal work from the seller. The seller spends about six hours per week on this business. They monitor the PPC campaigns, research snitches and keywords, and publish new books. All of the writing, designing, and voice work for the books has been outsourced, and the writers are willing to continue working with the buyer. A Facebook page is included that is focused on a specific niche. This can be utilized later down the line to promote books which are in the niche. So it starts with assets included in the sale is the Amazon KDP account, the ACX account, which the ACX account is a website that for audiobook publishers. It's all about audiobook publishers. So if you want to go, if you want to check that out, it's acx.com. It's all other things are included in the sale are all books, ebooks, audiobooks, and pen names, and a Facebook account, which which EmpireFlippers.com has been around a long time, but this is something that you, you might want to ask them, and I'm not sure about. I'm not sure that you can transfer or even sell a Facebook account, and I'm not sure how the transfer of an Amazon KDP account would be, how that goes. So that's something that I'm going to have to, to look into and, and get back with you. Maybe you know, next time I'll find out how that works. I'm not sure. I don't know if you just – I'm not sure how the transfer of – uh, assets from a one KDP account to another would go, but you know this isn't a fly-by-night company. EmpireFlippers.com has been around a while; they're pretty huge, and they, I'm sure they know what they're doing. So another place that you can find find good good digital businesses to buy are is Flippo.com, and I like to to buy apps, focus on the apps, and, and research those. And you can go to Flippo.com and browse by those and find out what apps are are selling, what they've sold for, and, and get some ideas if you build apps or want to have someone build apps. You know, both of these, one thing that I've, I've seen over the years studying these two websites is that a lot of these people don't create their own product. Like the one I was just talking about, they have hired a team of writers and all that kind of thing. So basically they have the idea they research snitches and they get someone else to do the work. And it's the same thing with Flippo.com. A lot of times these people are not building these websites or building these apps. They hire someone to do it and sell it or they monetize it, make some money and then cash out. So you don't necessarily have to be a good writer. You don't have to be a good coder. You don't even have to know how to do either of the two things. I recommend that you know how to read and write. That would help. But you don't have to be an expert or a or a and either one of those two things to, to make money in this. You can just have the idea, get someone else to, to, to do the work, and then you can cash in. I know I'm making it sound a lot more easier than it really is, but that's basically the, the gist of it. So this one particular app that, that I'm looking at is Galaxy. It's a new game for Android with a $763 revenue in May, 900 downloads a month and it has over a thousand installs the the app age is is two months so if it's already made 763 dollars i mean so and it's only two months old so that tells you the kind of money that apps can make so if you're not looking at apps you really need to look into it so I would recommend that if you want to build your Digipire, you want to, to make some new acquisitions, or, or you just want to study this stuff, that you do so at Flippa.com and EmpireFlippers.com. I mean, it just has a wealth of information. I might get your, your, your creative juices flowing. So now I'm going to discuss everything there is to discuss or at least what I can discuss in 10 or 15 minutes what's left of this show about ha uh, about having a brick and mortar business versus having a business in the cloud or an online business there's some vast differences or advantages and disadvantages to both and I'm going to go into a little bit of it today kind of give you a, a primer of sorts and tell you what I think based on my experiences. 
as usual, if you want to find out my latest projects and what I'm what I'm thinking about, what I'm investing in, what I'm building, you can do that at digipire.com. Just a second while I gather some notes and I'll be back with you beautiful people in just a few seconds. Okay, so episode 10, brick and mortar versus and having an online business. I'm going to give you a a brief introduction or a brief synopsis, I guess, of sorts and let you know my experience that I have had with both. I started out with online, you know, have an an e-commerce and affiliate marketing. I guess like a lot of people, I sold stuff on eBay when they first started in 19, not when eBay first started, but back in the, the beginning days in 1999. And I had sold a little tea kettle that I'd found at a thrift shop. And my my distant cousins were in the antique business and they had got me started on it. He was there, you know, they were much older than myself. They're actually my grandfather's first cousin, so that tells you how old they are. Or one of them's dead actually now. But they had got me started in it and I thought, well, even then, with the, the sure volume of, of things that were on eBay, even in 1999, there's no way that, that somebody is going to find my, my little little tea kettle. And, you know, I bought it to, to resell, and, and I hem and hauled for, you know, a couple of weeks, just thinking it would just be a waste of my time, that nobody's going to, and no one's going to find this, and, and the thousands and thousands and thousands of items that are on eBay, that were on eBay at the time. And so... I spent a lot of time with them, and after after a few short weeks, I decided, what the heck, I'm going to go ahead and, and list it for sale. I really had no no really attachment to it. I'm not really into to knickknacks and and pretty things like that. I'm interested in their value and what, the, what money they can bring and the profits they can bring, but just to have them laying around the house, I have no, that doesn't really interest me. So it was uh, laying around the house. I was getting them on there, so I decided to put it up for sale. So I paid about $5 for it, and I sold it for 25 And that, that, again, that's been a long time ago. So ever since then, I was hooked. So I did that for about a year, and then I got into Amazon and affiliate marketing. So I would – and Amazon was one of the, the first accounts that – or first affiliate accounts that I had – and I started selling stuff on Amazon auctions, and I was an affiliate for them, selling stuff that they had. An affiliate is basically I, bu- I had a I earned a commission for everything that I sold off their website. I actually didn't earn the product; I just made a small commission. I think it was at the time three percent. It was less than five or six percent. I can't remember what. So I build websites and and put the offers on the websites and all that kind of thing. And I did. Amazon auctions as well and even for a short time in 2000 I worked briefly at Amazon call center in my hometown of Huntington, West Virginia I was working at UPS at the same time at the same time and I have been told when I first started at the Amazon call center that they would work around my UPS schedule because I just had to I had to fill every slot of my day with something to do and so that's what I did so or that's what I was trying to do. And after the training was over, come to find out they could not work with my schedule with UPS. So I decided, because I just wanted to work weekends and evenings, basically, and I wasn't working at UPS. So it didn't work out. I wasn't willing to give my job up at UPS to work at the Amazon call center, so I, I didn't take it. But I got to learn a lot about how Amazon worked and uh, their, you know, just their their mode of op- their mode of operations is that what you say and how they operated so I did learn a lot about the company in my my three or four short weeks that I was there and so I can I continued to to sell on Amazon auctions but primarily on eBay and I did a little bit of affiliate marketing and then in 2002 I 2002 or 2003 I found out about Clickbank so I started selling ebooks on Clickbank. I, I would make websites and primarily on Clickbank I was doing email. I would send mass emails uh, via 
with ClickBank offers. So I would use some bulletproof hosting. And at first I started doing it at my house. I would do it through my ISP, my internet service provider. I would have a couple of computers set up and I would basically send hundreds of thousands of emails out to people selling ClickBank products. And I, I did very well with that. Very, very well. And it was, it was, and I'd already, I'd already quit my job. Actually, I started that in 2000, 2001 with the, the emails selling, selling casino. I was an affiliate marketer for some cas casinos. I can't remember the name of the affiliate program. I was trying to think of that the other day. But I had the website guide to casinos.com. And I would slap up affiliate links and, and do some SEO and, and drive traffic to, to them. And I would get a commission every time someone found every, – every time someone went to my website and joined one of the casinos. I can't remember what the payout structure was now. But so actually I was, I was doing that through email as well, doing the, the casinos – and sending mass emails doing that. So I started the email, I guess, earlier than what I what I just said. And then I did ClickBank in 2003. So I was doing very well for myself, doing affiliate marketing, sending emails, and selling on, on eBay and selling on Amazon auctions when, when it was there. I, I'm not sure when that they, they stopped that. But I had, stopped, I had stopped doing it way before they ceased operations. But I was doing very well, and it was in 2000 that I quit my job at UPS, and I was making a full-time income online, and that's when nobody knew what was going on. No one knew what I was doing. You know, I had a nice apartment, had a brand-new car, and nobody knew how I was sustaining that. Now, I wasn't living like a millionaire lifestyle or anything, but no one knew how I was sustaining my lifestyle when, from all outward appearances, I did not have a job. So that was very confusing to a lot of people, and it's still confusing to a lot of people. So even 20 years later almost, people still don't understand how I earn an income. And it's basically through affiliate marketing and e-commerce e and affiliate marketing. I mean, it's, it's pretty much as simple as that. So that is my journey. Well, actually, I still have one more piece of that puzzle. And then I started, then I thought, I'm going to try brick and mortar. So I did it backwards, what people usually do. And so in 2013, I decided to open up a thrift, shop, a thrift shop and kind of have, you know, sell in the thrift shop and sell online and all that kind of thing. So to make a long story short, because I only have 45 minutes and I'm running out of time, to make a long story short, I was in the hole from anywhere from 1000 to $1,500, $1,600 a month in the hole on that store. And that was with selling online. I sold most of my sales came online because I was using it to, to sell online. and basically using it as storage. And it got to be too expensive to, to keep the shop open. So I moved everything to Columbus, Ohio, into the only, to a warehouse and started just doing everything. I had part come into the warehouse, a small space in the warehouse. I had part come in, and I would ship it to Amazon FBA, fulfilled by Amazon. So when I closed my thrift shop, I was buying, I was buying things to, to resell, kind of like Marshalls or, or TJ Maxx, and would, kind of like what they do, but I was selling it online. So I shipped everything from my thrift store. It took a it took me about a month to close, and I moved everything from, I shipped everything from there to FBA to Amazon FBA, and everything that I had in the, in the shop. Close, I mean, sold with probably within eight weeks, everything had sold. So I had to keep buying more and more and more and more and more. So that's the, the gist of it. There's a lot of stuff that happened after that, a lot of issues, a lot of a lot of good things, a lot of bad things. But I'm not going to go into all that right now. I'm going to talk about the advantages and disadvantages of having a brick and mortar store. And you can follow my outline for the show at digitpire.com slash episode 10. Okay, well, it looks like I ran out of time. I'm going to have to continue this next week, next Thursday at 8 p.m. sharp, and I will discuss the disadvantages and the advantages of having an online store, an e-commerce store. So I hope that you will join me next Thursday at 8 p.m. I'm not sure exactly what the date will be, 
but I will continue this conversation then. In the meantime, you can visit our website at digipire.com. Thanks, everyone, and have a good evening.